this last Sunday to worship this year and listen to our call to worship from God's inerrant word, we find it recorded in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Shall we continue to worship by turning in our hymnals to hymn number 118, standing as we sing to the glory of God. Father, with joy in our hearts, we come before you to lift our voices in praise and in thanksgiving unto you for your blessings, your goodness, your mercy, for Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Savior. Your Heavenly Father, bless us with the ministering power of your Holy Spirit. May we draw closer to you, our Heavenly Father, and remember Jesus Christ. He came into this world to save sinners like each one of us. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for that gift. Bless us now. May we keep our thoughts centered upon you. May your name be praised. May it be glorified. May it be uplifted. For we ask and pray this prayer all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. And good morning. We welcome each and every one of you into God's house this morning. We know that he's going to bless you in this hour that we worship him together, and I greet you. In the name of a risen and a soon coming again Savior, I want you to turn to someone sitting alongside of your back view and wave, please. No shaking of hands. We had a flu season going on. Just wave and say hi. Just a few announcements that I want to share with you this morning. I call your attention to those friendship pads. They're directly in front of you in the pew there. It only takes a moment. You sign it, you pass it along. It's a great help in our ministry here. Now, today, all annual reports are due from the elders, deacons, Sunday school, youth, and all of our committees. Please remember today, all annual reports are due. And then tonight at 6.30 p.m., the book club ministry will be meeting However, it'll be at 5 o'clock, and they were meeting at the home of Paula DeMarc on One Knoll Court in Stratford to view the movie Left Behind. They invite you to come and be a part of their ministry. They have a great time of fellowship together, but keep this in mind. 
It's at 5 o'clock, not 6 o'clock, as it says in the bulletin. And they're asked to bring your favorite Christmas mug with you. Uh, I have no idea. That's what they told me to say. Bring your Christmas mug. I don't have a Christmas mug. Anybody else doesn't have one? I'm the only one? <laughs> Anyhow, bring your Christmas mug with you, and uh, you'll have a great time of fellowship. Keep that in mind. Our annual church meeting is on January the 18th at 12, 15 p.m. This is all LSBC members are expected to attend this significant meeting in our ministry. And then our midweek prayer service and our youth groups will resume meeting on January the 7th, so please keep that in mind. Our annual Christmas card exchange is available in the hallway to my left and to your right, but please today would you pick up your Christmas cards. They are there waiting for you. And with that, we, once again, we want to thank each and every one of you who placed flowers in the church for our Christmas time of worship together. We thank you so much for it. And today, you can take them home. However, there are some restrictions. You only take the red ones. The white ones and the pink ones, somebody else put in here in uh, and I, I don't think there's any cards on them. So the white ones and the pink ones, but if you purchased one through the church, you're welcome to come and pick up your red poinsettia and take it with you today. Once again, we appreciate it so much. We have two flowers this morning that I'd like to call them to your attention. One is in loving memory of Sherry Filato's birthday, which is tomorrow from her mom and dad. The second is a loving honor of our wedding anniversary from Ed and Gloria Jones. And it doesn't say how many years here. Ed, Gloria, you're here? Okay, we'll get you next week then. But we thank you so much for beautifying our sanctuary. I'm gonna ask the ushers if they will to come forward now as we continue to worship our living Lord by giving unto him our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
have it rise and sing our doxology together. Father, for all your blessings. We praise and thank you that you give us the opportunity to serve you by giving of our gifts, our tithes, our offerings unto you, that others might hear the word concerning Jesus Christ and salvation full and free in him. Bless the gift, bless the givers. Our Heavenly Father may both be blessed and that we ask our Heavenly Father that you will be will 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 be accomplished as you use these gifts all to your honor and glory. For we ask and pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Said the night wind to the little lad, Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lad, Do you see what I see? A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tear.
blessing so far, and I'm just... Or surprises. Always wanted to do that. <laughs> Is it on? <laughs> We're all right now. Again, you need to be in my brain to know what I'm thinking at the moment. I don't know what I'm thinking, but you can't say you're bored when you come to this church, I'll tell you what. All right, Larry, thanks for doing that. I appreciate that help because I couldn't do what you do. But anyway, oh, well, so far we've been blessed, and uh, this has just been great, and thank you, Lori, for being part of that blessing. Well, we do have these calendars still available, these little pocket calendars, and I am electronically challenged and I'm proud of it, and I'm going to glory resisting electronics. But at any rate, so this is my kind of stuff. But if you would like one of these, it uh, provides a scripture reading for each day so you can read the Bible in one year's time as well as make important notations and then these uh, Rockwell calendars are available as well, all to my left in the long hallway. If you're a Bible reader this year, and uh, let me know by putting your name on a slip of paper so we can acknowledge your blessing uh, in a couple weeks' time. And then this is the last Sunday uh, that we're trying to end the year in a God-pleasing, balanced way. And we appreciate all of your support, and however you're able to do that. And then keep praying for our nation, and with all of its various uh, upheavals and chaos and storms and fires, um, as well as all the blessings. God wants us to pray about it all, and uh, that we need to do. Now, some of the names on our list, uh, Mr. Yovita is still recovering from his a serious heart condition, so keep in, him in prayer. And Marie Brennan and Doretta Kosky are all recovering from their hospital stay. Norm Thompson is getting ready to have gallbladder surgery and Connie Lamphere. Amy Dow needs our prayer support, as does everyone on our prayer list, including Faith Henson, whose sister went home uh, to be with the Lord in recent weeks, so be in prayer for her as well as Mark. And then our missionary for the week, as you can see, is chosen people. This is still a wonderful time of the year for us, but also for the Jewish people. And God clearly says in his word that Israel are, is his chosen people, and this ministry is reaching out to the Jewish people with the gospel of Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. So let's pray for them all of this week. And now let's have a few moments of your time to pray privately. And then I'll ask you to join me in prayer. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our God, our own one and only almighty God, you alone are worthy to be praised. And with our whole hearts, we desire to praise you now through this time of united prayer. And during these quiet moments, gracious Father, we recognize your presence is never restricted by walls or personalities or troubles. You're able to transcend our emotions and able to enable us to experience your love in a fresh way. Through your power you have created the universe and us as well. Through your love we are redeemed by your grace. So we just worship you in spirit and in truth. We uplift your holy name. We 
thank you for your goodness that abounds without limitation. As we examine our lives in your loving presence, Heavenly Father, we would humbly ask that God the Holy Spirit will move within our minds, within our hearts, as we examine our lives in your presence, and however you convict us of that which is grievously sinful in your sight, we know that your desire is for us to confess those sins, repent of those sins, and seek your cleansing from that which we know is unrighteous in your sight. Thank you for loving us ever so much. Thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, whom we believe is alive and coming again. How wonderful it is to open your word and know that it's been perfectly inspired and we can read it for direction, for comfort, for correction, whatever is the need, you provide our needs as we read your every word. Father, we are so glad that we are able to pray for those who are in need, whatever that need might be. You know how to meet those needs. You know how to use us to bring your blessing into their lives. We stand ready to serve you however you lead us to do that in helping others. Bring those that we know by name who are living in rejection of Jesus Christ to a our wonderful Savior. Bring those that we don't even know around the world who are in need of salvation to our Lord and Savior. We're glad for chosen people. We're glad that their ministry reaches out to all people, but especially the Jewish people that you love so much and desire for them to put their faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. What a privilege it is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in our personal lives as well as through ministries like chosen people. We do give you thanks for America, Father, and it's a land that's filled with all manner of difficulty, but it's a land that's filled overflowingly with your blessing. So guide and direct our leaders and our people, Heavenly Father, for we desperately need to turn to Jesus Christ and your word to guide us throughout each day. Gracious Father, speak to hearts here in this place of worship or watching by television or on the internet as you know best to meet their needs. We humbly ask this prayer now by faith in that name which we know is to be above all other names that of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people joined and said together, Amen. May we stand and sing together another one of these wonderful carols of worship, 129. May we stand and sing together. Let's stand and sing together.
down our remaining time together, we're going to focus on the wise men in uh, God's imperfectly inspired written word, Matthew chapter 2. But there is a humorous video that I'd like to show to you. It's only four minutes, and it's about three men who were not so wise. So take your shoes off, kick back, and enjoy a little bit of humor, and then we'll get into God's Word together. Let me start by saying how pleased I am to be working with you three kings. I mean, it's great. I'm a huge fan of your work. Now, I know there's only two of you here right now. Balthazar will be joining us shortly. Now, I gotta say, I got some dynamite ideas for your trip to go see the Christ Child. This thing's gonna be a smash hit. You guys are gonna be number one. That's great, Mark, but we really want to keep this thing kind of simple. We're going on this journey to deliver our gifts and worship our new king. Whoa, whoa, hold on there, pal. That's one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about. I don't want us using words like journey and trip. From now on, we're calling this thing a tour. A tour? That's what the people want. The whole traveling afar thing, I mean, it's boring. You never hear about Aerosmith or Led Zeppelin traveling afar, do you? We're not a rock band. Not yet you aren't. Balthazar, come on in here. It's time to show you your new look. Balthazar? I don't want to go in there looking like this. Get in here and show the other kings. <laughs> now, that's the kind of outfit that says king. Literally, I had them write king on the back. Balthazar, turn around, show the other kings. It's pretty nice, huh, guys? I want to put on my old clothes. Don't be ridiculous, Balthazar. Have a seat. Mark, I don't think this is going to work for us. Today's rock and roll world is all about sequin jumpsuits and leather jackets and, and jeans with, with holes in them. Mark, I don't think that wearing that kind of a thing is going to be very practical while we're riding camels to Bethlehem. That's why you won't be riding camels. How else are we supposed to get there? A tour bus. We'll write three kings on the side of the bus in giant letters. I really don't think that's necessary. How else are people supposed to know if you three are in town unless you're driving a giant tour bus with your name written on the side of it? It's not like people are going to be flocking to see us. They'll flock to see you, all right, when they see this new tour poster. That doesn't look anything like us. It's got the three of you here. It's got the, uh, the gold, the myrrh, the frankincense. I have long hair, and I'm playing a guitar. Exactly. I don't think people should be seeing that. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, they're going to see the posters all right, because we're going to put them up all over, and we're going to put them up several months in advance. I mean, I want everybody to know that the three kings are coming to town. Otherwise, how do we expect to sell any merchandise? Mark, this is out of control. All this stuff you have us doing has nothing to do with the new king. Okay, okay, we'll sell some t-shirts with some sort of uh, baby Jesus design on them. We're not going to be selling t-shirts. This is not about commercialism. Look, do you guys want to go on tour or not? No, Mark, we don't want to go on tour. We just want to go and see the new king and present him our gifts. That's what this is all about. Well, it, is, is this the way you guys all feel? All right. Well, it was a pleasure working with you guys. Thanks, Mark. I'll just uh, leave this costume in the other room. Thanks, Mark. Um, sorry it didn't really work out. We'll keep your card. Thanks, Mark. Um, Janine, 
Why don't you uh, send in my next appointment? Ah, the um, uh, little drummer boy. How would you feel about the electric guitar? <laughs> Well, that's not the kind of wise men we're going to be looking at in this scripture today. But thank you, Larry, for showing that for us, and Bob for doing the audio. We appreciate it very much. So we're going to look at the real wise men in Matthew chapter 2, uh, the first uh, 11 verses in particular. I won't take the time to read them now, but uh, we will read them as we progress throughout the message. I trust that you had a little smile on your face uh, watching that video, but now we're going to have our hearts blessed by God's Word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can enjoy being in your presence in this your house of worship and prayer, and uh, we thank you that we are able to gather together in the name of Jesus Christ and in his name, Father. We pray that everyone within the sound of this voice will be touched by the Holy Spirit, bringing anyone to salvation, and certainly for the edification of all of those who gladly proclaim Jesus Christ as our wonderful Savior. Hum we humbly ask this prayer together by faith with complete trust in your will to be done. In the loving name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And again, all believers join and said together, Amen. Well, I heard about a man that was drafted in the army back in the days when we had a draft in this country, and he was drafted in the army, and he didn't want to go, so he decided that he was going to sabotage the physical so that he would be rejected. And so when he went into the doctor's office, the doctor softly said to him, do you see the eye exam on the back wall? And he slyly said as he squinted, what eye chart on the back wall? To which the doctor said, good, you just passed the hearing test. <laughs> well, I pray that you will pass the hearing test of God's word and the seeing test too as we look at God's word together. Now, I have not come to the pulpit to shatter anyone's mental understanding of the Christmas revelation. But we do need to be clarified to clarify about these three wise men. They were not at the stable. <laughs> no, you didn't just Yeah. They were not there, and how do we know that? Well, in verse 8 of Matthew chapter 2, you will see that they came and saw the child. Whereas in other descriptions, in Luke, it's re uh, the birth of Jesus is as a baby. You will also see in verse 11 that when they came to the Christ child, he was in a house, not in a stable. And we also know that it took them about two years, maybe a little less, to actually get there. How do we know that? Well, because in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 2, you will see that King Herod ordered all male children under the age of two, or two and under to be slaughtered with the attempt to kill off this so-called king of the Jews. And not only that, but there was no doubt more than three of these kings. Because, to be truthful, King Herod's kingdom was quite large. And so three kings going through his countryside would not have attracted anyone's real attention. Because that happened all the time. But a caravan of kings would have caught King Herod's attention. But we usually think it's three kings because three gifts are involved. 
But the point is, even though uh, there, it's a misunderstanding of them actually being there, they were wise. They were wise because in Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, they were seeking Jesus Christ in whom is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So they were wise. We don't know what their names were. Uh, because they're not listed in the scriptures anywhere. But Bible scholars and his, by biblical historians have discovered who the three names were. But because they're not in the scriptures, we don't need to even pay attention to that unless we're really interested in that sort of understanding. But they were magi, from which is the root word magician. They were not sleight of hand type uh, people, but they were uh, very intelligent. They were philosophers. They were counselors. They were very wealthy. And they knew the Hebrew scriptures because they were fulfilling prophecy when they followed that mysterious star. So they were very wise. But they were wise because they had a high IQ, which obviously they did. But here's why they were wise. They were wise, first of all, because they gave their time. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, you read where they left from the east and arrived in Jerusalem. And we don't know where they were in the east, but it took two years to get there, and that took time. And they were willing to give the time. Now, these were wise men who only knew what the scriptures said. And then they saw that mysterious light. And yet they took their time to do what they knew they had to do. And so they traveled to see the Christ child. Wise people use time wisely. I think of people who proclaim to be atheists, and like I said on Christmas Eve, there is no such thing as an atheist. They say they are, but everyone believes in something. So there is no such thing as really an atheist. But there are those who say, we don't believe in God. They think they have lots of time left. I've heard many people say, well, I don't need to get religious Tell I'm too old to have fun. I don't need to go to church. Tell I'm too old to not do anything else. They think they have all this time, and yet the scriptures tell us in Colossians uh, chapter two, verse three, that uh, or Second uh, Corinthians chapter six, verse two. Behold, now is the acceptable time. This is the time for an unbeliever to become a believer, because we never know when life is over. How many sudden death stories are we going to have to hear about before we all understand that we don't know anything except for this moment? That 17-year-old that was just killed Christmas Eve in Washington Township, I don't know anything about that young man. But all I read about was he was a great student and, and not a problem. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was struck and killed. And a few weeks ago, Mike Bradley knows the young man that was a construction worker delivering a load of sheetrock to a a high-rise project being built in North Jersey, 50 stories high. He got out of his truck early in the morning, didn't have his helmet on because work hadn't started yet. He's a believer. He's testifying. He's telling others about Jesus Christ. And 50 stories up high is a construction worker whose tape measure fell out of his work pouch, fell 50 stories down, ricocheted off, and hit him right in the side of the head as he was saying the words, God is good. He didn't know that that was going to be his last morning before he went to glory. Now that's in regards to a believer. What about all these unbelievers who think, oh, we can worry about God some other day when today might be the day? Time is valuable to get saved. Time is also valuable in being wise 
for the believer. Satan has conned believers into believing you don't need to go to church anymore. We've got more important things to do. That's why this Sunday, any Sunday after a big celebration is called Low Sunday. Because the numbers are not, what you saw last Sunday should be every Sunday. We could not accommodate in one sitting all the folks that are involved in this ministry. And you look around and you see people come and go and you see them for a few weeks and then you don't see them. And then you see people that you haven't seen for weeks and all of a sudden you see them. And I'm just happy for everybody, but you understand what I'm saying. Don't get all offended and the and, and, and pastor's stepping on toes again. The scriptures tell us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, I don't know how you can get around this. I do not understand how any believer can get around this verse. God says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, do not forsake the assembling together as is the habit of some. Your neighbor may not go to church, but we go to church. Family members may not come to church, but we come to church because we're not going to forsake the assembling together as is the habit of others. So that we, in Hebrews 10.25, can encourage one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. Very difficult for us to encourage each other if we're not in Sunday school. Very difficult to encourage another believer if we're not in church. Pastor, I didn't come out of my bed on a cloudy day to be slam dunked. Well, I'm telling you what the scriptures are saying. Here's a little story that illustrates what this is all about, who we are, who Jesus Christ is, who the church is. The story is told about a man who just had a small little store on a street selling a variety of general goods, and a big conglomerate came in and wanted to buy his store, and he didn't want to sell it. And so they said, all right, we bought the property to your left. We bought the property to your right. We're going to build one of our monster stores on each side of your little store. And then we're going to build a walkway between the two divisions right over your store. And that they did, all legally and proper. On the day of opening, they put up a big sign over the big company, big store, grand opening. And the guy at the little store put over at the front door of his store, main entrance. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the main entrance to glory. He said, no one comes to the Father but through me. God's word is God's main entrance to Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is God's main entrance for people to find the Lord and, and, and to worship him and to serve him. But that takes time. The wise men were wise because they used their time to find Jesus Christ. They were wise also because of their testimony. Their testimony. Notice each of the four blanks begin with the letter T. What do you do all week, Pastor? I think up outlines like this. Brilliant. Testimony. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 2. These wise men come in, and the first thing they ask is, where is he, meaning Jesus Christ, who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. They walked into the king, who was the king of everyone, including the Jews, in his mind, asking him, where is this king of the Jews? And they weren't asking about Herod. That was bold. That took guts. But that was their testimony, you see. We believe in Jesus Christ. 
We need Christians who are willing to take a stand boldly and stand up for Jesus Christ with our testimony. And here's why. There are total so-called atheists who do very good things to help other people and they don't believe in God. So for a Christian just to do good example, and we need to do that, thinking that just by my good example, my good works, people are going to want to come to Christ, that's false thinking. There are unbelievers who are way more kind to other people than are some believers. I've seen some believers say some just horrible things. There are total unchurched people who are more forgiving than some church-going people. So you see, us just living a good life, thinking, well, that's going to win people to Jesus Christ. Yes, we need to live a good life. But we need to, as they say, use your words so that people actually hear what we believe as well as see what we believe. And that's what these wise men did. Their testimony was about Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 3 of Matthew chapter 2. Herod was troubled. Absolutely. You mean if you talk about Jesus Christ to other people, they're going to get troubled? Yes, they will. You can go anywhere and talk about Allah, and not one person will say a word to you. I guarantee you that. You can talk about any sports figure in your world, and nobody's going to disagree with you. Or they might disagree with you, but they're not going to beat you up. You talk about Jesus Christ, actually use the words, those are fighting words. Yes? And you know within some of your own family circles, in circles of friends, you know it, that if you say the name of Jesus Christ, you're going to hear, let's not talk about religion at the dinner table or politics. Hello? But we need to lovingly but boldly say, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen of the world, I am a believer Thank God I am, and I am going to tell you that I am a believer as well. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So we need to be wise in the use of our time. We need to be wise in sharing our testimony as were these wise men. And then, thirdly, these wise men were wise because they trusted God's word to be true. They knew the Hebrew scriptures. Herod didn't. If you look at verses 4 to 9, Herod says, gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, the religious leaders of the Jewish people, and he asked them, what about this Messiah? Where, what are you talking about? And they said to them, they knew the scriptures, in Bethlehem of Judea, for his, this is what has been written by the prophet. And then he goes, they go on to read about prophecy. And then about, in verse 8, the child. And we've come to worship him in verse 8. And verse 9, where they came with the place where the child was. They trusted God's word to be true. Sad to say, there are believers, and I have no one in mind, so don't get out your mental church directory, who sing trust and obey, who don't trust and obey. Who sing about amazing grace and don't understand what grace is all about. They go through the same motions all the time, but they don't trust. James chapter 1, verse 22 Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Who are hearers of the word? 
those that come to Sunday school and Bible study to learn God's Word. Who are hearers of the Word? You folks and me, my, uh, right here. We're hearing God's Word. God says, now go out and do something with what you just heard. But we need to trust and obey God the way the wise men did, and in so doing, we will please God and be all that he wants us to be. So these wise men were wise because they gave their time, they gave their testimony, they gave their trust, and finally, they gave their treasure. As we read in Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, little boy came home from Sunday school one day, and mom said, what did you learn in Sunday school? Oh, we learned about the three wise men. What you learn about them? We learned about the three gifts they brought. Mom asked, do you remember what the gifts were? And the little boy said, yes. They brought goats, Frankenstein, and Smurfs. <laughs> well, you know that's not what they brought. They brought the gold to signify that their belief that he was God. And they brought frankincense as a sweet aroma that he would become as a sacrifice and myrrh, which is still used by funeral directors today, today, for embalming purposes. And so they were recognizing him as the King of Kings, the Savior of the world, the Messiah who has come, and who was going to die to become such. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, Jesus Christ said, you know what? Where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. Where is your treasure today? And just ask yourself that question, and that's where your attention is. Is it where God wants it to be? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, God says, you know what? I love a cheerful giver. I know that they can, don't want me to say this, but I need to say it anyway. Whenever a gift is put in those offering plates unwillingly, God doesn't want it. God doesn't need our money. That's a shocker. Imagine that. God really doesn't need but he wants us to give it because he knows where the treasure is for many people. So you can put a million dollars in that plate and we all might be very happy, but if, if it's not giving cheerfully, God doesn't want it. But if you put a penny in that offering plate, cheerfully, Lord God, like the widows might, I give this lovingly, this is all I can give, God will take that little penny and will bless it because it's cheerfully given. Treasure is what God desires from our hearts. Now, without Jesus Christ as Savior, as I say almost every Sunday, I realize if I were an unbeliever, I would just be, I would have turned me off long ago. I would have been at McDonald's in my mind um, doing something else because I have no interest. And why wouldn't I have any interest in what's being shown in the scriptures? Because I don't have the Holy Spirit within me. To me, that is an eye-opener. How come I don't have the same joy that the pastor's talking about. How come I don't sing joyfully like others seem to be? Because you don't have the Holy Spirit. And so God says, you need to become born again with God the Holy Spirit by accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. I do not assume that any of us are saved, myself included, just because I'm in church. I only know if you're saved if you tell me you're saved. You only know if I'm saved if I tell you I'm saved. But dear friends, I played that game for 17 years of my life. 
I played the religious game. And everybody thought I was saved because I was in church all the time with Bibles. I had so many Bibles that I could choose which color I wanted to take to church. But I wasn't saved. Thank God I had a pastor who knew it and wouldn't let up. And then I got saved. So every Sunday, whether I offend anybody or not, you will hear that gospel call to be saved. If you don't have Jesus Christ your Savior, now is the accepted time. Because you don't know if you're going to be here this afternoon. God's given you this time to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you do have Jesus Christ as your Savior and you gladly proclaim that, then as we go into a new year, it's time to look at how we use our time and how we're giving forth our testimony in word as well as an example. How much do we really trust God? These are shaky times. Do we really trust God? And what about our treasure? That which is most important to us. Are we willing to give whatever God wants us to give? If the answers to these questions are pleasing to the Lord, then God's answer to you is, you're wise. Let's pray together. Father God, you know every mind, every heart here. You know of any rebellion towards your word, towards your will. You know about any resistance, any rejection. You're omnipotent. You're sovereign. You overrule anything that we bring to you in objection. You can save souls. You do save souls. And I'm praying for that now. With every head bowed and every eye closed, with no one looking around, the cameras are not on you. Is there anyone with the uplifting of your hand would say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior right here. Anyone at all. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of sharing the gospel Planting the seed, your word is true, that it shall never return unto you void. So we pray that you'll produce the harvest within souls today. Uplift the heart of every believer here. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together. Amen. If you desire to speak with me about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Desire to be baptized by immersion, as was Jesus Christ. You're welcome to make your decision known to us as we stand and sing together our final hymn, Carol of the Year. We three kings of Orient are. Let's stand and sing together, please. 148.
Gracious Father, now as we leave this place that brings honor and glory to your name, we are going forth to places known and unknown to us. We who proclaim Jesus Christ as our Savior, you expect us to use our time and our testimony and the evidence of our trust and to share our treasures so that others will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior as we have. We humbly ask you to take us home safely, but as we go, will you bless us as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and may we leave rejoicing over the truth that because Jesus Christ is alive, the best is yet to come. Amen and amen.